Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's good to be in the Father's house. Yes. He has goodly tents. In his goodly tents. <laughs> Amen to that. Page one. Matovu. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Good to see each one of you out this morning and welcome. It looks like you survived the holiday yesterday and the great cook off and the passing out of the trophies. So we want to acknowledge that Paul won that. We wouldn't call it a landslide because it was one vote. <laughs> but a win's a win, right? A win's a win. <laughs> and it sounds like everyone had a great time, lots of good food, and uh, good fellowship around the things of God, and that's what life's about. Amen. This morning we'd like to read from Psalm 79, and I'm going to be using alternate translations. You can kind of go through the one that you have, 
Usually we read from Stone's Tanakh, and uh, there's times that it does a fine job, and there's other times I really don't like the way they put it. <laughs> so I look in different translations that I have on my computer, and I go, boy, there's the one I like. So I print it off, and, and so I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version this morning. You may or may not be familiar with that. It uh, is real close to literal, uh, does, I think, a good job that way. And I like uh, kind of the updated language. This is a psalm of Asaph. O God, the nations have come into your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. They have laid Jerusalem in ruins. They have given the bodies of your servants to the birds of the heavens for food, the flesh of your faithful to the beasts of the earth. They have poured out their blood like water all around Jerusalem, and there was no one to bury them. We have become a taunt to our neighbors, mocked and derided by those around us. How long, O oh Lord, will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like fire? Pour out your anger on the nations that do not know you and on the kingdoms that do not call upon your name. For they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his habitation. Do not remember against us our former iniquities. Let your compassion come speedily to meet us, for we are brought very low. Help us, O God of our salvation. For the glory of your name, deliver us and atone for our sins for your name's sake. Why should the nations say, where is their God? Let the avenging of the outpoured blood of your servants be known among the nations before our eyes. Let the groans of the prisoners, prisoners come before you. According to your great power, preserve those doomed to death. Return sevenfold into the lap of our neighbors the taunts with which they have taunted you, O Lord. But we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will give thanks to you forever. From generation to generation, we will recount your praise. Amen. 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 And one day that will be fulfilled that psalm. And in the meantime, God is about the calling out of people for his name. Never forget, the delay is not because God doesn't care. The delay is because he does care. And I am so glad that the Lord didn't come back 80 years ago or more to, to me, I'm not quite 80 yet, but let's call it 67 years ago because there was a day of redemption that I needed to experience and God was so faithful to bring that to pass and each one of you can relate to that as well Amen. and so as we go through difficult times and as Israel and the people of Israel go through difficult times remember that there is a divine purpose and that purpose is the calling out of a great throng of people for his name out of the nations. And that's occurring. Even today, there will be some who will be saved. Even today. And this coming week, to the glory of God. But there'll come a time when the fullness of the Gentiles will have come in. Whenever God has ordained that to be. And then the eyes of the Israelites will be opened. And then great things are going to happen. And all Israel is going to believe. And Yeshua is coming back. Yes. And the kingdom here on planet Earth will be established in its fullness 
Can you only imagine in your wildest of imaginations what the coronation is going to be like of our king Hallelujah. in Jerusalem? It will be filled with pageantry. I think some tears and a whole lot of excitement. I don't know how it's going to work with all of us there. If we're going to have on our iPods the ability to watch what's going on because there's going to be a lot of us and we're going to try to see up there is he coming in yet or not. All of us trying to get around the eastern gate. <laughs> I don't know how it's going to work. The Father's got it well in hand. And so this is the God that we're worshiping this morning. He's the sovereign God, but he's also the redeeming God, and he's our heavenly Father. Yes, yes. So stand with me as we praise his name and rejoice in him. May he receive our praise. Barku et Adonai Hamvorah Baruch Adonai Bless the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Blessed be the Lord who is worthy to be praised forever and ever. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Shem Kevod Malkuto Leolam Ba'ed Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever. Amen. Vahavta et Adonai Elohecha v'kol levavka uv'kol nafshika uv'kol meodecha Vahayu had varim ha ele, asher anochi, mitzvocha hayom ala bevecha, vishi natan lo benecha, vadibata bam bashib da kaba veteka, uvlekha kava derek, uvshakba ka uv kumeka, uk shartam la ot o yadeka, vahayu la tota fot ben enecha, uk tav tam o mazuzot veteka, uvish ar echa. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Let these matters that I command you today be upon your heart. Teach them diligently to your children and speak of them while you sit in your home, while you walk on the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. Bind them as a sign upon your arm and let them be a sign between your eyes and write them on the doorpost of your house and upon your gates. And you should love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments rest the entire Torah and the prophets. And we're on page six.
Ukata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Natan Lanu Et Derek, HaYeshua B'Mashiach Yeshua. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the way of salvation in Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Page 7 for the Amidah, the standing. Eloheinu, velohe avuteinu, reze vimnuchatinu, hadsheinu, vimitzvotecha, vetein chelkeinu, vitoratecha, sobeinu, vitovecha, Vesamalkenu, Yeshua Teka, Vetaher, Libeinu, Leavdeka, Vemet, Vetaher, Libeinu, Vetaher, Libeinu, Vetaher, Libeinu, Leavdeka, Vemet, Beta heli beno, beta heli beno, beta heli beno, le abde kabe met, behan ki leno, adonai eloheno, beava vrazon, Shabbat Hadshecha Vayanochu Vayizrael Mecha Deshe Shmecha Baruch Atadonai Mecha Desh Hashabbat our God and God of our fathers, be pleased with our rest. Sanctify us through thy commandments and set our portion in thy Torah. Gratify us with thy goodness, gladden us through thy salvation, and purify our hearts to serve thee in truth. Give us thy holy Sabbath, Lord our God, with love and favor as our heritage. And may Israel, who sanctifies thy name, rest on it. Blessed art thou, Lord, who sanctifies the Sabbath. Yeshua's disciples asked him how they should pray, and this was the prayer that he uh, presented to them. It's a model prayer that contains within it beautiful truth about, uh, I think, the elements that are important as we pray. doesn't mean we have to pray every one of them every time, but... Uh, to catch the heart of God in this particular prayer. Avinu Shabbat Shemayim Yid Kadesh Simcha Tavo Malkutaka Yaatzer Razonka Baoretz Ka Asher Naasa Bashamayim Tenlanu Halom Lukem Lukenu Uslak Lanu Et Ashmatenu Ka Asher Sokim Anaknu La Asher Ashmulanu, Vaal Tivienu Lade Masa, Kiim Hatsilenu Minhara, Kilaka Mamlaka, Vahagara, Vahatiferet, Olame, Olamin, Amen.
Hallelujah. Let's continue worshiping God in dance and song. Oda binu kai, oda binu kai, oda binu, oda binu, oda binu kai, oda binu kai, oda binu kai, oda binu, oda binu, oda binu kai. I'm Israel, I'm Israel, I'm Israel kai, I'm Israel, I'm Israel.
blessing on Barry and Batya Siegel for writing that song and, and letting us sing it. And we just thank you, Lord, for them. Bless them. Increase them in finances. Shall go out with joy, be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will bring forth before you. There'll be shouts of joy. All the trees on the field will clap, will clap their hands. And all the trees on the field will clap their hands. All the trees on the field will clap their hands. All the trees on the field will clap.
sing this song, Holy Unto You, I think of Lori, because she's the one that came to me and said, Roger, can you please learn this song? <laughs> Holy
The Torah portion this morning is found in Bamidbar, Numbers, chapter 24, verses 1 through 9. Ya'amod Garrett, Ben Scott, Ben Avraham, La Torah. Bar Kuit Adonai Hamvarak, Baruch Adonai Hamvarak Leolam Vaed, Baruch Etsa Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam, Asher Bar Karbanu Mikol Ha'amim, Vinatan Lanu Etorato, Baruch Etsa Adonai Noten HaTorah, Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose us from all peoples and gave us your Torah. Blessed are you who gives us the Torah. Amen. Balaam saw that it was good in Hashem's eyes to bless Israel, so he did not go as every other time toward divinations, but he set his face toward the wilderness. Balaam raised his eyes and saw Israel dwelling according to its tribes, and the Spirit of God was upon him. He declaimed his parable and said, The words of Balaam, son of Beor, the words of the man with the open eye, the words of the one who hears the sayings of God, who sees the vision of Shaddai, while fallen and with uncovered eyes. How goodly are your tents, O Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel, stretching out like brooks, like gardens by a river, like aloes planted by Hashem, like cedars by water. Water shall flow from his wells, and his seed shall be abundant. By abundant waters, his king shall be exalted over Agog, and his kingdom shall be upraised. It is God who brought him out of Egypt according to the power of his loftiness. He will consume the nations that oppress him and crush their bones, and his arrows shall pierce them. He crouched and lay down like a lion, and like a lion cub, who can stand him Him up? Those who bless you are blessed, and those who curse you are accursed. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, Asher natan lanu torat emet, Vechai olam natah bitukenu, Baruch atah Adonai, no ha Torah, Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who you gave us your true instruction and planted everlasting life in our midst. Blessed are you who gives us the Torah, Amen. He who blessed our fathers Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, may he bless Garrett, Ben. Scott ben Avraham, who's come up to honor God in the Torah. May the Holy One bless him and his family and send blessing and prosperity on all the work of his hands. Amen. Etz Kaim He, it's a tree of life. Etz Kaim He, Lomo Tosikimo. Wisdom is a tree of life to those who hold fast to her, and all who uphold her are blessed. Her ways are of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. Cause us to be turned to you, O Lord, and we shall return. 
Renew our days as of old. The Haftorah portion is from Micah, or Micah, chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose good prophets, delighting in their words, which were spoken truthfully. Blessed are you, O Lord, who chose the Torah, your servant Moses, your people Israel, and the prophets of truth and righteousness. Listen now what Hashem says to me. Arise and contend before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Listen, you mountains, to the grievance of Hashem, and you bedrock, the foundations of the earth. For Hashem has a grievance with his people, and he will contend with Israel. My people, what wrong did I do to you, and how did I tire you? Testify against me, for I brought you up from the land of Israel, Egypt and, had esteemed, and redeemed you from the house of bondage. And I sent Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Miriam before you. My people, hear now what Balak, the king of Moab, schemed, and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered him. And from all the events, from Shittim to Gagal, in order to recognize in the righteous acts of Hashem. You ask, with what shall I approach Hashem? Humble myself before God on high. Shall I approach him with burnt offerings or with calves in their first year? Will Hashem be appeased by thousands of rams or with tens of thousands of streams of oil? Shall I give over my firstborn to atone for my transgression or the fruit of my belly for sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good. What does Hashem require of you but to do justice? to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, rock of ages, righteous in all generations, the faithful God who speaks and performs, who declares and establishes, whose words are entirely truth and righteousness. In the past, God spoke to our fathers through the prophets at many times in various ways. But now in the end of days, he has spoken to us by the Messiah, his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The son is the full radiance of God's glory and the flawless manifestation of his reality. He sustains all things by his powerful word. After he made atonement for sins, he sat down in the place of authority beside the majesty in heaven. The reading this morning from the apostolic scriptures is from Kepha Sheni, 2 Peter, chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe who has given us Messiah Yeshua and the words of the renewed covenant. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the renewed covenant. But among the people there were also false prophets, just as there will be false teachers among you. Under false pretenses they will introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, and thus bring on themselves swift destruction. Many will follow their debaucheries, and because of them, the true way will be maligned. In their greed, they will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their punishment, decreed long ago, is not idle. Their destruction is not asleep. For God did not spare the angels who sinned. On the contrary, he put them in gloomy dungeons, lower than Sheol, to be held for judgment. And he did not spare the ancient world. On the contrary, he preserved Noah a herald of righteousness with seven others and brought the flood upon a world of ungodly people. And he condemned the cities of Saddam and Amorah, reducing them to ashes and ruin as a warning to those in the future who would live ungodly lives. 
but he rescued Lot, a righteous man, who was distressed by the debauchery of those unprincipled people. For the wicked deeds which that righteous man saw and heard as he lived among them tormented his righteous heart day after day. So the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and how to hold the wicked until the day of judgment while continuing to punish them, especially those who follow their old natures in lust for filth and who despise authority. Presumptuous and self-willed, these false teachers do not tremble at insulting angelic beings. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave us the word of truth and planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the renewed covenant. At this time, we'd like to uh, bless all the women that are here this morning. In Isaiah 62, 5, it says, As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. So this is for all the ladies here this morning. <laughs> A woman of valor who can find, she is worth far more than precious jewels. The heart of her husband's safety trusts in her, and he profits greatly thereby. Bless all of you ladies this morning. And now we'd like to bless the children as the gentlemen come to establish the kupa for us. We would invite the children to come down and stand under it. And we'll invite those that have pictures with them of children and grandchildren, if you'd like to come down and stand under as well. For a blessing for them, you come and do that.
Yisamek Elohim ka Ephraim Minashe vaki Yeshua HaMashiach. May God make you as Ephraim, Manasseh, and Yeshua our Messiah. Yisamek Elohim ka Sara Rivka Raquel Leah the Yeshua HaMashiach. May God make you as Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Leah, and Yeshua, our Messiah. May the Spirit of the Lord rest upon you, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of power, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And may you delight in the fear of the Lord. Shabbat Shalom, blessing on you, children. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. We're having Shabbat school this morning? Okay.
Well, I would just call your attention to the bulletin for the announcements. Serving lunch at Open Door Mission, probably highlight that one on the 13th, which would be a week from tomorrow. And then we want to highlight the fact that there is, uh, are we calling it dance camp? Yeah. Okay, dance yeah, camp. Workshop. workshop. Okay. I knew it was a dance something. Uh, that will be occurring from 1 o'clock until about 4. And uh, there's some logistical things that we need to address. And one is all the chairs will have to be moved. And so we're going to need support in doing that. But it needs to be organized a little bit because it all has to come back. And so... Here's kind of how we want to proceed. We're going to take down all of the things that we put up. So the banners and sound system and everything, and we'll try to get that put away as quickly as we can. Uh, and then we'll take care of the chairs. So we need help, but really we need that to kind of uh, come in an orderly fashion and as we need you. Uh, because if everybody just picks up a chair and takes it outside, we'll never know where they're at. So <laughs> that isn't going to work. Uh, any other announcements? Maybe something I am not aware of or? OK. Well, I invite you to turn your Bibles to Psalm 19. I have the opportunity to teach the next three weeks, so I've decided to do a three-part series on Psalm 19. So we have 14 verses, and we're going to break it down this morning. We'll look at the first six. Next week, we'll look at 7 through 12, and then uh, on the 19th, we'll look at verses 13 and 14. So we'll, we'll try to make this manageable. The psalm is just filled. Uh, as I begin uh, to do the study, I thought, oh, my you could preach a message on every verse uh, just in light of uh, the significance of this particular psalm. I want to work with this psalm within the context of the heart. You know me, I'm always talking about the heart. And so I would remind you of the five principles. I hope that you have that little handout I gave several months ago tucked away someplace where you can pull it out. Um, and if you can commit these to memory, that's the best, because the five are always operative in everything that's going on in your life. And sometimes it's going to be more uh, pungent to you. You're going to be very aware that this is occurring. And uh, I like to be able to, during the event, work through this. And if I don't have enough wherewithal, reasoning power to do that, then I do that after the event so I can learn from it. And so here's the five principles. We are who we are in our hearts. What we believe in our hearts is what we really believe. We don't see things the way they are, but the way we are. We are where our hearts are. We can't be anywhere else. And I'm going to stop a moment there. So that means this morning that if your heart is focused someplace else, you will not hear what I'm going to teach on. That's the reality of this. Now, you might be able to pare it back from short-term memory, a few of the things. You might take a quick glance at your notes and say, well, it was Psalm 19. But I'm talking about God ministering to your heart. You need to be here. And you need to have your heart focused on the Word of God, Amen. so that the Spirit of God can minister that to you. We are where our hearts are. We can't be anywhere else. And then fifthly, our hearts make decisions automatically and instantaneously. Proverbs 4 reminds us all, all, absolutely every issue of life comes from the heart. That's why these five principles are so important. And so let's... Uh, Take a look at Psalm 19, verses 1 to 6, and we're going to apply some of these uh, five principles along the way, something I like to do as I'm studying. 
And even as I'm worshiping, I'm, I'm saying, okay, first of all, where am I at? <laughs> am I in worship or am I thinking about how I want to do the introduction in the message? See, my heart can go different places. And uh, the minute it went there, I said, no, we're back to worship. That's what this is about right now. We'll do the introduction when we get there. And so I've entitled the message, The Glory of God in Creation. It comes right out of the first verse. This psalm basically is in two parts, even though I'm going to put it in three. Verses 1 to 6 is a hymn to creation, and verses 7 to 14 is wisdom poetry. Although the last two verses, 13 and 14, are application. How do we walk this out? How do we live it? And so uh, I think we'll find that a very interesting portion of Scripture when we look at that in a couple of weeks. So wisdom poetry is focusing on the Torah of the Lord, and we're going to look at that. So I would invite you to read ahead a little bit. And just quickly... There are six things listed. Four relate to us. The second one, fear, talks about the fact that it's enduring, so it talks about fear. The sixth one is the judgment of God, and it talks about it, the judgment of God, what it's about. So I'm asking myself, why are the first four related to me, and then the other two relate to the subject that is talking about fear and judgment? Don't have an answer yet. That's a question you can ask yourself. The Spirit of God gives you an answer. See me before the service starts next week. Well, let's uh, look at this section divided up this way. The Great Declaration in verse 1, and we're going to spend the bulk of the time on verse 1 because it's foundational, and the other verses seem to be supportive information. And I'm very conscious of time. We will be done at noon because we've got other things to do. So keep your hearts here. Don't worry about 12 o'clock and moving chairs because uh, I'm committed to you and uh, being responsible. And so don't worry about that. I've got it covered. The Holy Spirit has it covered or we're in big trouble. So the first point on is verse 1, the Great Declaration. Second point is the reoccurring support, verse 2, that's night and day. Point three is the paradox of the noise of silence, verses 3, 4a. And then the crowning achievement of God's creation of the heavens. And in this text, it's going to be the sun. Now, it's in this context, it's the crowning achievement of God's creation. I think in the overall picture of God's creation, you and I are the crowning achievement of his creation, mankind. And so that's 4b through 6. So... Let's walk together through it. We'll read verse 1. And if I don't get done in time, we'll just stop wherever we're at because i got two more weeks and we'll pick it back up. <laughs> the heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse, some translations, firmament, is declaring the work of his hands. So the great declaration is coming by two sources, the heavens and the expanse. The word heavens here, uh, Hashemaim, de is describing everything God made besides the earth. You have the earth and then you have the heavens, so it's everything. That's one part of it. It's the place of the both seen and the unseen that is far above the surface of the earth. It's also the place God dwells. Biblically, that's what it talks about. The heavens is the throne of God, and the earth is the footstool. The expanse, or firmament, depending on your translation, is more related to that which was created around the earth, where the birds are flying or the airplanes are flying. Uh, and also, it's called the heavens or the sky. And so sometimes you're reading and without looking at the actual Hebrew, you're not sure which is which. Is, are we talking about uh, Hashem Mayim or are we talking about Harakia, which is firmament? 
Uh, so the idea of the firmament or the expanse is that which we can observe with our senses. So the sun and the moon and the stars would all kind of incorporate that. And so the heavens, all of the heavens, everything out there is telling of the glory of God. But this kind of the local part, that which we can see with our senses, that is declaring his handiwork because we can see it. And then the more we have the development of telescopes and things like that, the more we can tell what's even farther out there and, and the significance of that. But even with the naked eye, some evening, a clear night, you can go out and say, oh my, this is a marvelous creation. And see the beauty of things. Seeing a mediate, me meteor going across the sky. Uh, different kinds of things that occur. Some of the showers that occur uh, from time to time in the sky. Beautiful. Well, think with me for a moment about the vastness of our universe. First of all, we need a new way of measuring the distance. And so we use the term light years because this is huge. Light traveling at the speed of 186,282 miles and two feet. No, I'm kidding about the feet. 186,282 miles a second is the speed of light. Do you know how far that is in a year? Approximately six trillion miles. Six trillion. The sun is 93 million miles away and it takes eight light minutes for the light of the sun to come to the earth. Traveling fast. Now what's so significant about is this is, is the fact that God spoke and there it was. He spoke, let there be light. And there was the sun, greater light, lesser light, the moon, and then all the stars. The nearest star, not counting the sun, is 4.24 light years away. That's the nearest one. If you happen to have been on board the New Horizon, which left back in August of 06 to go to Pluto, traveling at 60,000 kilometers an hour. It's taken nine years to get to Pluto. It used to be a planet, remember Pluto? Now it's not, it's the dwarf planet. It got downgraded. So next year, New Horizons should arrive, 2015. Nine years. Now if, if we decided let's just go on to the nearest star, you know how long our travel would be? 78,000 years to get to the nearest star. It's 60,000 kilometers an hour. Nearest star. So when we talk about the majesty of God, the magnificence of God, when we talk about the power of God, we're talking about someone who could speak a word and there it was. And all of it perfectly arrayed. Scientists tell us that the Earth's orbit around the sun has to be exactly as it is. We'd all fry up or freeze to death one or the other. And if things weren't just exactly as they are, we wouldn't have enough oxygen. And God's maintaining this. And here's the exciting part. He didn't spend 10 years trying to figure this out. He spoke a word and there it was in his great, vast, creative ability. God imaged it and there it was. Going to the next beyond and that's going into this whole area of the nebula, which the nearest, well, I don't know if it's the nearest. I, it's not the nearest. I think ring nebula is the nearest. But the one I picked out was Helix Nebula, which is 650 light years away. 650 light years away. And in a year you go 6 trillion miles. And it's 2.5 light years in diameter. 
Now, how are they figuring all this out? I don't have a clue. I'm trusting the scientists on this. You know, if they're off a foot, I wouldn't argue with them. But then they project, and they didn't name this one. There's another one on beyond the Helix Nebula, and it has a number, and I didn't write it down. I think it's 1245, but I, I don't remember for sure. You know how far it is? 100,000 light years from planet Earth. 100,000 light years. And our God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now you put that into perspective. King David knew this perspective. And when he saw Goliath compared to David, he was big. But compared to God, he was puny. See, that's, that's the perspective that we need. Do we serve a God who has it covered? Can he handle this? Absolutely. Put the Helix Nebula out there, 650 light years away. He can certainly handle the struggles you've got right now in your home, maybe water in your basement or whatever is going on. Could be physical issues. Could be issues in the family. Our God is able. And I didn't take the time. That's the macrocosm. You go to the microcosm, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Whether you go out here, it blows your mind. Whether you keep bringing it in here, it blows your mind. God and his great creative ability. And so the heavens and the expanse, they are declaring and describing the glory of God because it's rooted in his handiwork. And so let's look just for a moment at the word telling and the word describing. They're both PL participles. If that's important to you, if it isn't, don't worry about it. PL just is intensification, and then there are just some Hebrew words that only show up in a PL. But if we look at the word telling, safar, it means to recount. And then in the PL, it has the added idea of to tell, declare, and to show forth. And so the heavens, however far it goes, I don't know how far it goes, but all of it is recounting, it's declaring, it is showing forth the glory of God. And then the local area, the expanse, the firmament, that which our senses can see, that is declaring. And that's the word nagad. And it means to place a matter high, conspicuous before a person. And so that is putting in a conspicuous place the handiwork of God. You can't go outside of an evening and look up and not have to say, there is something significant going on up there. And it brings forth an understanding that at least there's a creator. I wouldn't go so far as to say that anyone could be redeemed from seeing creation, but certainly it's telling that there is a creator. And so the heavens are telling, the expanse are declaring, it's interesting, in 2 Chronicles 6 and verse 8, 18. 2 Chronicles 6, 18, the prayer of Solomon after the temple was built, and he's overwhelmed by all of this. And what he's overwhelmed by it is that God would choose to come and dwell in his temple. It was magnificent, absolutely was magnificent. Compared to the tabernacle, it was just mind-blowing in its size, in the beauty, all the gold and silver and bronze. and I mean, it was just something else. And then Solomon is humbled because he's saying, my God would be willing to come and dwell here. And his dwelling place is the heavens. <clears throat> In the English, it says... His dwelling place is heaven, the highest heavens. Okay? Heaven, Shemaim. Highest is Ushemei. 
heavens. Ha Shemayim. And so we really have Shemayim in three forms. We have just basic Shemayim heavens. And then we have the noun construct form. Ushemay. And so a construct always means we're going to something else. It's under construction. So we usually have of after it. So heaven, heavens of the heavens. Hashemayim. That's where God dwells. I don't know if Solomon had an idea about the helix nebula or not, but he knew this is big. And that's where God's at. And yet he's willing to come and dwell in this place because he's put his name here. In order that we, his creation, could know who he is. And then, beloved, think that he lives inside of you this morning. This God does. And it's because he loves you and cares about you. And he sent his son to seek and to save that which was lost. And at one time, that was every one of us. Bless his name. Bless his name. And all of this is about the kavod, the glory of God. It's not about just knowing numbers. It's not about some intellectual thing that we can talk about, the Helix Nebula. It's about the glory of God. It's about his majesty and his wonder and his greatness. The idea of glory in the root form in uh, kavod is to be heavy or weighty. And when it relates to, say, a human being, it's relating to the fact that someone is honorable, impressive, and worthy of respect. How much more our Heavenly Father, the great Creator, all of that applies to. Worthy of honor. He's honorable. Look what He's done. He's impressive. Has anyone even come close to doing the kinds of things he's done? I can remember a comment made about all the scientific achievements that were going on in the creation. There's always talking about man, you know, creating life, that kind of thing. No, all we're doing is reshuffling things. We're not creating things. God's the creator. We can take two things that exist, put it together, and get something new, maybe. But we don't create. God, out of nothing, created. There was nothing. He said, let there be light, and boom, there was light. But this was the comment. Even if, and it's not going to happen, but even if, let's say, you could take and dissect a frog and then put it all back together, you know what you'd have? A dead frog because you can never put life back in it. Only God puts life in. Right? Isn't that true? So, scientists can do all that they want to do, but they will never, ever reach the level of what God has done. Never. And so, therefore, he's considered quite impressive. And so we can never use too many adjectives. We can never overstate the case of the greatness of the Lord. And then he's worthy of respect. Worthy of respect. There are a lot of titles that are used of the Lord, and they're all important. He's the creator. He's the great God. Um, he's our redeemer. Um, he's the shepherd. He's our heavenly father. And all of them give us different pictures of his response to us and his, really, responsibility to us and the greatness of who he is. All of them are important. I really enjoy the one that he is my heavenly father. Well, notice that it says the glory of God. That's the word El, which is kind of, I, I, some think it's a contraction or the shortened form of Elohim. But it's the idea of power or the mighty one. And this word is used with a lot of descriptive adjectives or various attributes. He's considered the God of gods. He's the forgiving God. He's the holy God. He is with us, Isaiah 7, 14. 
Emmanuel, God with us. There's L. He's the God of our salvation. And then I like Isaiah uh, 12, 2. Hine El Yeshua Behold, God is our salvation. We sing that song here. What's the next part? We will trust and not be afraid. See? Because we know who he is. And where is it that we know who he is at? In our hearts. Beloved, everything we're talking about this morning and you're shaking your head, yes, yes, yes. And if it's only an intellectual belief, if it's only caught in the intellectual part, left brain ox is the only place that this material is going, you hit a crisis, it won't serve you. Because what you believe in your heart is what you really believe, and that's going to come out of the right side, the right brain lion. And if you don't believe it there, you're not going to believe it. And so I'm always watching what's going on in my life. How am I responding? That's telling me I've got a place in my heart that's filled with lies, and I've got to deal with that. And I pray often, Lord, change my heart. I pray often, Lord, help me to see today what I believe that's not true, that's keeping me from believing your truth. I find the greatest hindrance I have to walking with God is all the things I believe that aren't true. Or things that I just give mental assent to and in my heart I really believe something else. Driving here this morning, I was visiting with the Lord about an issue, personal issue. And I said, Lord, it must be true that I believe that in my heart. How did it get there? And how do I get it out of there? Because I know it's so contrary to your word. And I'm looking forward to this week, I and my father working on that. That's what it's about. Well, the heavens and the expanse are doing the declaring. And then there's this reoccurring support. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. Day is sun, sunlight. The night we have the moon and the stars. And so day and night combine to display God's glory because they are the work of his hands. It's within the firmament. It's that which we can see. Their declaration of glory rests upon the fact that though they are inanimate entities, they are the work of his hands and so reflect positively upon our maker. But the speech of the heavens and the firmament of day and night has a twofold thrust. Notice that. It's, it is addressed to God as praise, yet as mankind reflects upon this vast expanse of heaven with its light by day and its hint of the greater universe by night, that reflection may open up an awareness and knowledge of God the Creator, who by His hand created a glory beyond the comprehension of the human mind. And that's why Paul could write in the book of Romans that mankind is without excuse, because the sun and the moon and the stars declare that there's a God. And then we go from there. Now he's self-revealing, absolutely self-revealing, but is there an openness to respond to his self-revelation to you? See, that's the question. And for all of us here as believers, uh, if we're all believers, and I'm assuming we are, then that happened one day. You know, this whole concept of the heart has changed the way I pray for people and their redemption. I've got a number of people that are lost that I'm praying for. One's my granddaughter. And I pray this way. Father, whatever lie right now needs to be impacted by the truth so that later on they can believe in your son. I'm praying for that right now today. Because until that truth comes to bear upon the heart and that lie's dealt with, they'll not respond to the gospel. What you believe in your heart is what you really believe. So you come with the gospel message, and if they don't believe that's true, they'll never respond to it. So the great work of the Holy Spirit, and you can call it pre-evangelism if you want to. I don't think it's pre. 
It's part of evangelism. It's part of salvation. It's maybe the first step, but it's still part of it. The heart has to get touched. And so that's why living is important, living out the gospel. One of the best things you could do for your neighbor is live a holy life in front of them because that'll impact their heart. And we all know of stories where people have said, the only Bible I know was my neighbor. Loving, caring person. It all counts. And it's important to go ahead and share the truth, the biblical truth. All of sin comes short of the glory of God. I'm not denying that. But that may not be the place to start. Prayer for your neighbor and their heart is where to start. Well, verses 3 and part of 4 says... There's no speech, nor are the words, nor are their words, their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out. Line is a, not a good translation. It really should be sound. Their sound has gone out through all the earth, and their utterance to the end of the world. Here we have this paradox of the noise of silence. There's no speech, no noise from a literal perspective. But on the other hand, there is a voice that penetrates to the farthest corners of the earth. Because no matter where you are on planet earth, when the sun comes up, when you're on that side where it comes up, you're going to see it. I was just, some of it was I had my thoughts here, but you know, it's been a little cold. I've been out painting in a sweatshirt. And on Thursday morning, it was cold and then the sun broke through because the clouds were gone. I could feel the warmth coming. And I said, Lord, thank you for your marvelous creation. Thank you that I can take my sweatshirt off this morning. Thank you that there's this warmth coming and it's reminding me of your greatness. But right now I'm also acknowledging the warmth of your love for me. Thank you to love me. Who am I that you should love me? But you do. And I just want to worship you. Yes. One thing about painting, it doesn't take a lot of focus so you can worship God at the same time. Oh, what a great father he is. The psalmist conveys something of the subtlety of nature's praise of God. It's there, yet its perception is contingent upon the observer. To the sensitive, the heavenly praise of God's glory may be an overwhelming experience. Whereas to the insensitive, sky is simply sky. The stars are only stars. They point to nothing beyond. Because that's what they believe in their hearts. See, they need a heart change. Not a head change, heart change. It's not about more intellectual information. It's about revelation of God coming to the heart. There's nothing wrong with knowing facts. There's nothing wrong with reading and, and memorizing, those kinds of things. Intellectual exercises, I'm not against that. I'm just saying it's inadequate. Don't, we can't stop there. If it doesn't get to the heart, it hasn't fulfilled its mission. That's why when the Holy Spirit is, is at work, you know where he's working? He's working to take his truth and impact our spirit that lives inside of our hearts. And from there, it impacts the heart. It's not head in, it's spirit in. Human spirit. And I wish I understood this more. I'm very much a novice in this subject. But God has changed my life so much in the last two years, I can't believe it. If he gives me another two, I hope there's just as much in the next two. Well, last point, and with this we'll close. Last part of four. In them, the great heavens and the expanse, he has placed a tent for the sun, which as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, it rejoices as a strong man to run its course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. So this is the crowning achievement as the psalmist sees it in this section. And that's the sun. There's a pitched tent. 
And this is kind of a poetic language related to the place of the sun's night rest. Where does the sun go? Well, it goes to sleep, then it comes up. <laughs> well, we know it's just a rotation of the earth. We can explain it. This is poetic language. The Lord has this tent. What's important is the fact that it rises every morning. Now, you may not be able to see it because of clouds in the sky, but it's there. What happens when the clouds part? Poof, there's the sun, right? It's there all the time. Consistent. And you will know when the sun isn't there any longer. I don't know how long, because you'll shortly be dead, but you're going to figure it out. Something's happened here. Well, God is taking care of his creation, and the sun comes up every morning. The psalmist used two similes there in verse 5 to illustrate the sun's glorious emergence on the eastern horizon each morning of the year. So sun rises like a bridegroom going forth from his chamber. The bridegroom's emergence from the chamber in which the marriage was conducted. So you have to envision this a little bit. Maybe think about some weddings you've been to. And the best I can do is those that, that I'm familiar with, that after all the vows are taken and everything is done, there's an introduction. Now we have people in covenant. It's Mr. and Mrs. And then there's this pomp and circumstance music and they march out. And guess what's on their faces? It's the biggest smiles you've ever seen. Part of it is they're relieved the ceremony's over, but part of it is they're excited. <laughs> they're excited about the fact they're husband and wife and a new, new life is starting. Right. And so that's part of the simile. The sun is breaking forth. And that's a picture, a reminder of how God's love is breaking forth, how his kesed is breaking forth. All of nature is being used by God to image something deeper and greater in his relationship with us. And then the second simile is like a warrior or a hero who in his vigor rejoices to run and exercise his strength. The idea is no holding back. No holding back. And there's no holding back the sun. And during the course of the day, the sun passes from one end of the heavens to the other, shedding its heat on all that lies beneath it. Nothing is exempt. Well, that in a nutshell is the first six verses. And I encourage you to ponder that. I've got three points in regards to a conclusion. First of all, we would be remiss if we didn't join creation in giving glory to God. Yes. It's a tremendous, tremendous privilege that I think sometimes we just get too busy to do. We're about other things. Our attention siphoned off. Can we see God in the midst of everything? Really see him there, not just a cliche. Oh, God's got it taken care of. Really believe it in your heart and give God glory for it. In the midst of this difficult time, I know, Father, that your grace will be extended to me. I know I got up this morning and your mercy was renewed on my behalf. Oh, I just praise you for that. And I am remiss in not giving glory to God on that. Now, when I get up sick, I do, because I need him to get through the day. But when I hit the floor and I feel good, then I'm, I'm about other things. And then he has to kind of say, okay. Are you going to get me in the midst of your life today? Oh, sure, Father. It's where you need to be, center focus. We need eyes to see afresh his creation. God uses nature to help us understand how our hearts work. One of the best illustrations from nature is the butterfly to help us understand 
how God changes people's lives. Authentic transformation, the butterfly. Intellectual transformation, the frog. Study those two sometimes. And the thing I liked about the butterfly is the caterpillar does what? Climbs up a tree, fastens himself to a, a branch, hangs upside down, has a chrysalis form, turns to soup. Now, how would you like to do that? God says, I want to change your life, but you've got to become soup first. You say, is there a plan B? <laughs> Hanging upside down, you can't do a thing. This, what a beautiful picture of transformation. Well, lastly, we serve a great God. How great? <laughs> Ponder the creation. Amen? Amen. Next week we'll look at the Torah and pick right up from here. So we'll invite you to turn to the Kaddish this morning on page 26 as we pray Israel's greatest prayer of praise. We're wanting to remember family and friends. Remember yard sites? I'm going to read one name here in just a moment. But the names that we're reading are the following. Fern Williams, her yard site's coming up this month. Joseph Polanski, Roger Massey, Joe Bays, Peter, Naomi, Thomas, Hurriana, Kennedy, Malti, Veronica, Kathy Elkin, Julie Thompson, Jordan Hayden, Doug Patton, Catherine Fideli, Tyree Winnig, Helen Parks, John Nordlow, Lee uh, Walker, Shalomi, and uh, Marcy Cheney. And then we have one here, Kathleen uh, Meyerson, uh, Aunt Bill Vans. Are there any other yard sides or anyone else? Yes. Okay. All right. Was there another one? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I agree with that. And also the Palestinian teenager who was murdered. They're all God's children. Yeah. Okay. All right, Roger. Yid Gadal, the Yid Kadash, Shemei Rabah, the Alma, Divra, Ki Rute, the Yamlik Malkute, the Chaye Kon, the Yome Kon, the Chaye Kolbe Israel, the Agala, the Isman Kari, the Amru, Amen. Yehe Shemei Rabah Mavorak, the Alam, Alome, Almaya. Yid Barak, the Yishtabak, the Yid Par, the Yid Romam, the Yid Nase, the Yid Hadar, the Yid Hale, the Yid Halal, Shemei the Kudashah Bariku. Leila min ko birkata vishirata tushbakata venekamata dami ram biyama vimru amen. Yehe shlama raba min shemaya v'chaim alinu v'yol kol Yisrael vimru amen. O se shalom bim romav v'ya se shalom alinu v'yol kol Yisrael vimru amen. Magnified and sanctified be his great name in the world he has created according to his will. May he establish his kingdom during your life and during your days and during the life of the whole house of Israel, even swiftly and soon, and say, Amen. Let his great name be blessed forever and to all eternity. Blessed, praised, and glorified, extolled, extolled, and honored, magnified and lauded be the name of the Holy One. Blessed is he, though he be high above all the blessings and songs, praises and consolations which are uttered in the world and say, Amen. May there be great peace from heaven and life for us and for all Israel and say, Amen. May he who makes peace in his high places make peace upon us and upon all and say, Amen. I'm going to invite you to turn uh, to... Dean, I just put one thing in there. I want to worship the Lord just for a moment. Okay. And then we'll, and then we'll end. 
with okay. the, the debt. I, I, I brought this in, and I didn't know what you were ministering on today. But when you said that about worshiping the Lord, I thought there's a reason I brought this because... You go for it, brother. Father, thank you for the way you're at work in our midst. Thank you for putting on Roger's heart to bring that song this morning. Oh, how beautiful. How touching. Giving us an opportunity to express what was in our hearts to you. We thank you that the revelation of who you are is ongoing. And that we caught a glimpse of creation and its display of your handiwork attributing to your glory. And we want to join in to say we serve an awesome God. 
and that you are able to handle every situation that comes forth. And no temptation that's overtaken us also has a way of escape. But that escape is always through you and your provisions for us. We thank you, Father, that we live in times that are challenging. We live in times where information is somewhat, somewhat overwhelming because we can know what's going on in every part of the world. And unfortunately, there's a lot of heartache and difficulty and wickedness Help us to remember that every report we hear like that, that you're at work in the midst of that, and that there will be redeemed in those circumstances. There will be brothers and sisters who are there as light and salt because you have a remnant everywhere. And the fact is that you are about your purposes. And the great enemy of our souls can never stop what you have determined you will see happen. And we've been told that the world is going to get really ugly and that sin will abound and the hearts of men and women will turn cold. And so we just pray that as we are preparing ourselves in these days, that when that ultimate hits, known as the Great Tribulation, our lights can shine brighter than ever before. Because we know in that time, there will be a great harvest. There will be many. We're told biblically that there are those that can't be numbered. And where did they come from? They came out of the great tribulation. Because you're at work redeeming people. You've come seeking and saving that which is lost, lost people. And sometimes the light is even brighter in the midst of great darkness. Father, we want to join our hearts together and as a congregation say to you this morning, thank you for our individual redemption. We're here today as redeemed people because of what you have done in us. And we very much want you to reveal yourself to us in a greater way. That the concept of yieldedness and submission to you can become a way of life in order that your Holy Spirit can use us mightily as we go forth. You in us and you through us to the glory of God. We ask all of this in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. Yavarekaka Adonai Ve Reka Ya Er Adonai Panava Laka Vikuneka Yisaha Adonai Panave Leka Vayasem Laka Shalom The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Sar Shalom, oh, our blessed, marvelous Prince of Peace. In his name we pray, Yeshua the Messiah. Amen. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.